everybody. We are the Good Doctors of Abbey Research. I'm Dr. Aaron. I'm Dr. Kristen. And welcome back to our continuing coverage of Netflix's smash success, The Crown. We are up to episode five, The Coup. Uh, for those of you just joining us, we don't do minute by minute recaps. Um, we do more kind of contextual analysis and thematic reviews and stuff like that. So if you're looking for a straight recap, look elsewhere, but thank you for finding us in the first place. We are also experts, uh, academic experts in Northern Ireland, particularly in the prolonged and protracted conflict that took place there from about 1968 to present, um, although now it's transformed into a political conflict. And we're a little bit miffed that this show taking place during the real, real start of the conflict and the most violent parts of it is not dealing with Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland at all. So we are also starting each recap by saying exactly what's going on in Northern Ireland uh, at the time of this episode because the show's not doing it. So this show episode, Coup, is taking place in the year of our Lord, 1967, um, which is when there is a burgeoning civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. Um, over uh, issues of inequality and a predominantly uh, minority Catholic population. Um, and we're certainly building into a lot more violence, which will come uh, pretty much by episode six. Uh, we are immersed in, in an ethno-national violent conflict that again, is not mentioned. So we'll save some of our rage for uh, episode six because uh, that's when it's a little bit more appropriate. Right now, nothing, major is happening in Northern Ireland that would warrant interference in this episode again. This episode is yet another uh, puzzle for those of us fans of The Crown as to why we are spending this much time talking not about Elizabeth, although this one was fairly split between uh, her Uncle Mountbatten's attempted coup and her love of horses which has been established in this show already. Again, I don't know why we are returning to parts of Elizabeth that we have already, I feel like, dealt with dramaturgically. So I thought we had dealt with her relationship with Margaret and the, her insecurities, Elizabeth's insecurities over being the monarch versus Margaret's insecurities, you know, not insecurities, confidence over her potential to be the, a monarch. I'm here for stories about their relationship, just not the same stories. And I felt like that what they've done with Elizabeth and Margaret this season has been the same story. Uh, similarly, we spent a lot of time um, with an Elizabeth who all she ever wanted to do was raise racing horses, which like, fair play. I'm sorry that you were made the sovereign when you didn't want nor expect it but you are the sovereign and you have been for pushing 20 years now. Uh, so I didn't find it a particularly interesting storyline that she's still marching off around Europe to buy horses uh, with Porchy. This is also- Especially one of, when she's got Harold Wilson in her parlor telling them they're devaluing the pound. Yeah, that was the other thing we just discussed offline. I don't believe that the Elizabeth they have shown us how she has grown into her role as a leader, would look at Harold Wilson when he said, the economy is reaching such a crisis that I have to devalue the pound, which is a very, very significant thing to do. And she was like, well, I'm gonna miss my meeting next week because I'll be looking at horses. And mommy can handle it. And, and my mother can be deputized to have a meeting about devaluing the pound. Uh, it, just, it just was so incongruous with the evolution that they showed us in the first two seasons. Of and like, I think they wanted that dramatic moment on the phone where she like then becomes sovereign again. And like, yes. that's fine. That is dramatic, Peter Morgan. And he wrote this episode. Yeah. But like, there are, I just constantly feel like he's taking all the lowest hanging fruit when it comes to tension. Like there are a million ways to show that there are, there's so much more complicated ways to talk about this, that she, her whole, I mean, cause as far as we know, she still feels the tension between being a horse person yeah. and a country wife and a queen. Yeah. But 
you honestly want me to believe that she and Porchy took a trip around the world that wasn't covered in the papers, nobody was bitching about it, and it was happening while the pound was being devalued? He was gone for a month. No way. I, there's Philip says at the end of, of the episode, a month. And like, if this was historically, so neither one of us had an opportunity just because of filming schedules to research if the coup and the horse trip were at the same time. Right. Um, and so well, it's possible that Elizabeth know, did make this call. Yeah, we do know that there were rumors of an attempted coup, I'm sure exaggerated for the effect yes. of this uh, episode. We do know that there were meetings that took place between Lord Mountbatten and What's-His-Face, the guy that was- The newspaper dude. The Daily Mirror dude. Um, we do know that they had meetings that took place and there were, we do know there were lots of grumblings about Harold Wilson's leadership. For um, sure. For me, this was another one of those instances in which Peter Morgan wanted to say something about 2019 Britain. Yeah. Um, and he said it in 1967. Um, this whole idea of the greatest generation of returning to the glory of the United Kingdom with a, a room full of uh war veterans uh and a lot of this going back to the way things used to be when things were better rhetoric is very very common right now in the united kingdom um and particularly in britain particularly in england um for those of you that aren't necessarily if you aren't paying attention to um kind of british politics right now so for me, it was a little too on the nose. I was like, cool, you're making a statement. Of, and like these kind of sentiments do cycle. So it's possible that they were also going through this phase in 1967 of kind of the- And I certainly think they were, like just in my colloquial knowledge of, of, the, of the process of Wilson's government and how socialism enacted. And I'm sure that she, I'm sure that there were lots of conversations about what do we do when democracy is crumbling and right. all of that. It was just- Huh. Yeah, and for me, like... There are just more interesting ways to tell the story. There were more interesting t ways to tell the story. Um, and there are more, I feel, I feel like there have to be more interesting stories we can tell about this sovereign. I feel like he's run out of them in his imagination. And so yeah. he's turning not that and you know i don't want to say that like not that she is incapable of being reflective again later in her life like we all do that we all as we age and as things change go oh i wonder what things would have been like um but it, it was just so strange that she went on this trip for like a month and pretended that she was just you know a country wife who loved racing horses until she got that phone call from harold wilson that was like your uncle is staging a coup yeah like i don't run a country i i you know <laughs> i don't run a country full disclosure. Do, full disclosure <laughs> full disclosure i don't run a country but i do have some leadership responsibilities in a company yeah and i'll tell you that i haven't taken a mental vacation since that occurred mm -hmm. like I am never, no matter where I am in the world, I am never mentally far from thinking about payroll. And like, so it would, it bum fuddles me that she would take a month long mental vacation. Like well, well, why, of course she should have been calling every day to get updates. She has been told that the country over which she is sovereign is burgeoning an economic crisis. And like, have you not read, like, this would be front page news in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal too, the devaluing of the pound. Oh yeah, because it has major economic consequences, not just for the UK, but for the rest of the world. And at this the point, they owed world. us, at this point, they still owed us money from World War II, I believe. I so believe like, so, yes. And we had just loaned them all that money as well, which we learned earlier in the season. Um, this episode was weird. It, it I did love the closing me. moments with Philip, with her and Philip. I did like the really, I did like with her and Philip, that was cute. I did like her dressing down of Mountbatten, that was amazing. She was like, I choose my country. I am choosing my country, thank you very much. Um, that is the Olivia Coleman I'm here to see, not the one that like simpers over horses, but uh, fine. Um, and then I actually liked the conversation with Princess Alice and Mountbatten at the end. Um, humanizing them both a little bit and talk because i think this season is a lot about 
aging. Yeah. And generational changes and adjusting to generational changes, uh, both in politics and in families. Um, and I think yeah, it's like the last three seasons of Downton Abbey. Yeah, yeah. So this transition of power, um, even if it's just, it's not the queen, we know this, bless, bless both Philip and William. She's not going anywhere. <laughs> but they don't know that in 1967. Yeah. Um, so there are all these rumblings of, of that, which I found interesting. But again, for me, this season is, aside from the Aberfan episode, like five minute chunks of greatness interspersed in the middle of puzzling storylines and character development, to say the yeah, least. Yeah, I mean, my, my guide for if, I care, if I'm deeply invested in something is how often I check Twitter on my phone while I'm while I'm watching. And in Aberfan, I didn't pick up my phone at all. Mm -hmm. um, except a couple times to pause and check historical accuracy. Right. But like this one, that whole speech that Mountbatten was doing to the room of dudes, I was like, uh-huh, sure. I've, yeah, I've heard this before. Like, and it's just not, I don't know. And maybe I'm just tired of stories I'm tired of this particular version of British history they're telling. I don't know. I don't know what my drama is, but I'm with you. Like, there's five minutes of, like, oh, this is why I fell in love with it. Mm -hmm. And then there's a lot of fluff and nonsense mm -hmm. where I feel like we're on Peter Morgan's soapbox about something, and I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, which is why it's puzzling, right? Because we don't know. I mean, I'm just looking at my notes. I'm like, and I'm writing down, like, are you kidding me? Why do I care? Seriously? Like, these are the things I'm writing down. And that's not indicative of a person who's, like, so engrossed in the narrative and so with the storyline. Yeah. Um, and not that, you know, everything has to be done according to my tastes or to your tastes, but I like things to make some sort of sense. Mm -hmm. I don't like spending a whole season, and we've talked about this, this is our lost baggage. Yeah. Um, among many other shows, but particularly Lost, like, I am very wary of being led astray. Yes, I am very wary of non-tight storytelling. Yeah, and storytelling that when you get to the end doesn't make any sense, that the middle doesn't make any sense at the end. Um, and I'm worried that that's where he's going to go, and I'm like, but you have an actual historical record to work with here? So That is deep and fascinating and insane and, like, all these people are so interesting. I would love to learn. I know we don't know that much about Elizabeth and we can't, but like, we can try. <laughs> we can try more than horses. Or if we want to talk about horses, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But also explore, then take that a step further. Have her give us some, like, this is another, we've talked about this. We wish they did like her monologue. We wish we, we wish they yeah. would let us hear her voice, but like, tell us if she felt ashamed of herself for abandoning the country. Tell us if she thought about that at all. Tell us like, t okay, you want to tell the story? Tell the story. Yeah. Don't half ass this thing where then you get to go on location in Kentucky. Like, you know, I know. It was so, I was like, cool, you just wanted to go back to America? Like, uh... I mean, Kentucky's lovely. I went to college there four years. It's gorgeous. Lots of horses. I mean, the whole nine. But, like, yeah. That's my, that my review of this episode is, <sighs> I just, I just flashed to, like, the other, com like, whatever episode it was where she was focused on the horses and Philip got angry with her and thought she was gonna cheat on him with Porchy and it was the same story we were telling again and yeah. it's just well it was interesting I will say in terms of Porchy that they kept that we got his visual reaction to the idea that his queen didn't want to be queen yeah that was fascinating why don't we sit with Porchy a little bit then like <laughs> Come on, Peter. Come on, buddy. Anyway, um, I think we've... I think we've exhausted our thoughts yeah. and things about this episode, episode five. Uh, we'll be back next week for episode six, um, which covers Philip's investiture as... Uh, Charles's Charles, investiture. Charles, sorry, Charles's investiture as the Prince of Wales. Um, 
so we'll see again we're not spending a whole lot of time with the crown even though it could be argued that he is the future crown but that future as we all know is quite a ways away from his investiture um so we'll see what we learn from that one and how infuriated we are at various aspects of the storytelling but for now, we're the Good Doctors of Abbey Research, and we will see you all for episode six. Take care, everyone. Bye.